sign of His glory and grace. Amen. Amen. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do for midday. We're going to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Um, I was, okay, here we go. I'm sorry, I was gonna, I'm going to be streaming this at the same time. All right. So we're going to be looking at a topic entitled The Beauty of the Lord. Amen. We want to turn our eyes to Jesus today, right? Yes. We want to hear some good news today, right? Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen. Sabbath is a beautiful time, right? Yes. What a beautiful day, isn't it? Yes. Beautiful right. weather, isn't it? Beautiful. Yes. It's like air conditioning outside today. Yes. Wow. It's awesome. We're going to have a good time this afternoon, too. In, in the uh, fresh air, open air. Yes. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to need Lord. strong men at 2.30 <laughs> to set up. All right? Strong young men. We have them. Yes. I don't know how young they are, but... <laughs> like Brother Joel. <laughs> Amen. All right, so... Um, you know, that phrase, the beauty of the Lord, is found in only two places in the Bible. That, those exact words, the beauty of the Lord, five words. They're, it's that exact phrase is only found in two places in the Bible. It's found in Psalm 27, verse 4, and we're going to pray in a minute. This is like an introduction to the study, all right? Psalm 27, verse 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. And what is that? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To do what? To behold the beauty of the Lord. Yeah. And to inquire in His temple. Amen? Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. Beautiful. R written by David. And you know, David wrote both of these. Both texts that have this phrase in it came from David. And the next one was Psalm 90, verse 17. It says, so notice he says, first in Psalm 27, 4, he says, one thing I seek, one thing I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord so I can behold the beauty of the Lord. And in verse 17 of chapter 90, he says, and let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be on us, be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Amen? Amen. So he says, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. And I want it to be upon me. Amen. Is that your desire today? Yes. So are we turning our eyes upon Jesus? Amen. Right now? Amen. Do we want to see the beauty of the Lord? Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. So this is, you know, in Psalm 27 verse 4, David reveals his main desire. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And in chapter 90, verse 17, he admonishes us as himself to let the beauty of the Lord, of our God, be upon us. Today, we're going to focus on do these two things. And we're going to, we want to behold the beauty of the Lord so that we could let that beauty be upon us as we move forward from this point. Amen? Amen. So to do that, we, we need to pray. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to just thank you so much for how you have been blessing us today, even from the beginning of this year. It really is a, an awesome thing to, though the world gets darker and darker, darker, we can sense that our environment is getting brighter and brighter. And so, dear Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for unfolding your glory to us. We thank you for these wonderful studies that you've been giving to us. And so, dear Father, we come to your throne today for no less. We, we want you, Lord, to speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you will use this, this ragged vessel. I come before you, dear God, to be used by you, and I ask you to use me as your vessel. I pray, Lord, that you would empty me of self, and that you would radiate yourself through me to all of us, and that, dear Father, we will hear your voice speaking, and that we will see your beauty even more today. For, Lord, we know this is your desire to reveal yourself more and more to us. And so, dear God, we come before you asking you to do this tonight, today, and this afternoon, and we pray that your holy angels will be involved to protect us and shield us from all distractions. And we pray, Lord, that you give every single person within the hearing of my voice a special blessing 
to be able to receive what you have today so that we can give to others that which you give us. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask these things according to your will in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, so... The first place that I want to take you to to find the beauty of the Lord is the first book that was ever written. Anybody know what that was? We think it is Job. The book of Job. We're told that Job was the first book written, right? The first book ever written. We want to go to that first book to see if we find the beauty of the Lord in that first book. You with me? Now, I'm going to set the tone for you so you can understand the environment that we're in as we explore this certain part of the book of Job and his experience. Okay, so he, he just got mocked by Eliphaz the Temanite in chapter 22. And then we're going to dive into chapter 23 and see Job's response, right? And in his response, we're going to see if we can find the beauty of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So we start with verse 1 of chapter 23 of the book of Job. Then Job answered and said, and verse 2, even today is my complaint bitter. Now we know that complaining is not of the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. But Job was a man. He had defects like we do, right? He was, but he was a righteous man. He was a man that was surrendered to God. But he, was, he had a lot of things going on him, you know? So he says this, Even today is my complaint bitter, he says. He says, My complaint is bitter, and my stroke is heavier than my groaning. What is he saying? Think about what he's saying. My complaint is, yes, it's bitter. In other words, it's not a good thing. It's bitter. It's, it's really not. It just doesn't feel good. It's, it's bitter. It's not, it's not sweet. My complaint is not good, but my stroke is heavier than my groaning. In other words, the stroke is heavier than my, than my complaint. Yes. That's what he's saying. Yes. Okay? If anyone knew suffering, it was Job. Mm. Would you agree? Yeah. If anyone knew suffering in the entire Bible, it was Job. Right? And his troubles began. Yeah, Job chapter 23. Right? We're looking at Job chapter 23 right now. And we're, we just read verse 2. Right? <clears throat> He says, even today is my complaint bitter, but he's saying my stroke is heavier than my groaning. He was admitting that his pain was worse than what he was expressing with his lips. So his troubles began when? Now we know there was a, 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 this, uh, I would say parabolic or a, a symbolic kind of meeting. We, we've already touched that in the past. And we learned that it had more of a symbolic meaning, the meeting between God and Satan. But his troubles didn't necessarily begin there totally. Right? We give all the credit to that conversation between Satan and God in Job chapter 6, verses, you know, from chapter 6 on. But his troubles actually began when his sons and daughters grew of age. And if you go back and read Job chapter 1, you'll take note that Satan had to actually wait till the opening was made for him to afflict Job. There was an opening made for Satan to come. You know, Satan, you know, we're told that Job had a hedge around him, his property, his children, his everything. His flocks, right? Everything around him, he had a hedge around him. But something made a breach. It wasn't just that conversation between God and Satan where God just gives him permission to go and wreak havoc. If you notice, if you take note, he ha Satan waits till an opening was made for him to afflict Job. If you read carefully, brethren, you will see that the troubles started when Job's children began to behave like the heathen. They all gathered, if you read the story, they all gathered for seven days. 
How many sons were there? Seven sons and three daughters. And they were partying, partying each day at every brother's house till they got to brother number seven. Are you with me? They were partying and, you know, and since they were drinking and eating and all these things, when you look up that word drinking in the original Hebrew, it meant to intoxicating drink. They were getting drunk. They were drinking fermented alcohol. They were drinking fermented wine. So if you read carefully, you will see that the trouble started when Job's children began to behave like the heathen. They all gathered seven days to party and get intoxicated. In other words, they made a choice. They made a decision at that point not to follow in the footsteps of their father. Are you with me? Amen. Do you know that your children, when they get to the age of accountability, they can open a door for Satan to come in? Yes. You know that? Yes. And it can affect you. Yes. Yes. You know that? Yes. That's what happened with Job. Yes. His, all his children, all ten. And I'm sure that the, the males were kind of maybe even, even kind of influencing, or even the oldest one might have been influencing the other. Who knows? Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly how they got into that position because the whole history is not laid out before us. But we know what the end result was. You understand? We know how people get to that end result. It's a progression of rebellion. Right? And even after they had their party, what happened? Well, you see Job making a sacrifice for them because even he had the intuition to know that whatever they were doing was not right with God. You with me? So they were sinning. They, were, they opened the door for Satan to come in. Satan had to wait. And who knows? what other evils they were committing that were not detailed in the Bible. Their actions opened the way to all the evils that happened to that family on the seventh day of partying. What happened on that seventh day of partying? All hell broke loose. And why is it, notice it was seven. It must have been a complete defilement of the principles that Job was trying to instill in them. You know, seven means completion. Right. Seven days, all hell broke loose. Why? What happened at the ark? Seven days, what happened? You know, we, we, yeah. seven is a symbolic, you know, it's a number, of right. a symbol. It, it means completion. It means that whatever they were doing was in perfect rebellion. Mm -hmm. okay, is there such thing as perfect rebellion? Yes. Yeah. It means you seal yourself off in sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it means that they became fixed in that. You understand? They became sealed on that seventh day. That's tragic. That's a tragedy for Job, for his children, for everyone. You know what I'm saying? But that's what happened. They opened the door to Satan. Their actions opened the way to all the evils that happened to that family on the seventh day of partying. They opened the door for Satan to enter in and they made a, a, a breach in the hedge that Job had made around them for many, many years. Amen. And in that same day, brethren, Job lost his oxen, his asses to thieves, and there were lots of them. Because Job was the, the, the most richest man, the most you know, greatest man of the East. You read that in the Bible. He was the greatest man of the East, as far as, you know, having stuff and being, you know, He lost his sheep. His sheep were burned. His camels were also stolen. His servants were killed and burned. Some of them were burned with the sheep. And some of them were also killed when the thieves came to steal. His oldest son's home was destroyed. By some type of tornado or who knows what. His sons and daughters, all ten of them were killed. All in one day. His wife then mocks him and God because by mocking him, she was mocking God. He gets afflicted with sore boils on top of that. From the soles of his feet up to the crown of his head. Then to top it off with a cherry on top. That was the whipped cream, by the way. 
<laughs> that was the whipped cream. But to top it off with the cherry on top, his so-called friends mock him severely. I mean, what else could have gone wrong? Could you name anything that could have gone wrong above that other than him losing his life too? No, that's it. Everything hit him like a ton of bricks. So did Job have a reason to complain? I mean, to, 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 to every eye, you would say, oh, absolutely, right? Yes, he did, absolutely. But he didn't blame God, right? He describes his complaint as bitter. But then he said that the stroke that he had received on that historic day was heavier than his groaning. Job was under a severe attack. Mm -hmm. But as we just said, he didn't cast blame upon God. But you got to ask yourself, why? Why did this man, all these things happen, and you know, some of us, we complain over some little stuff. Yeah. Little stuff, and we blame God even. God, why you allowed this to happen to me? Not yeah. <laughs> I remember one day I bumped my head, and I wasn't doing nothing wrong. I said, but, and I was like, I was almost, I was tempted. Say, well, Lord, what? <laughs> why did you allow that to happen, Lord? You know, but God is not responsible for everything we do. You know what I'm saying? We, we should have been paying attention to that, whatever that obstacle was, and not bumped our own head. Um, why is it that this man, who lived so long ago with such limited understanding, according to what we think he understood, why would he not blame God? Didn't all the prophets write as if everything happened from God? Why was he the exception? Notice that if you look at how the Hebrews wrote, the Hebrew idiom of permission, everything came from God. The world was flooded, God drowned the earth. Sodom and Gomorrah burned with fire, God burned them all up. That's called the Hebrew idiom of permission. The Hebrews wrote, as if everything, whether good or bad, came from God. But in the case of Job, he was an exception to the rule. Why is that? Wow. Can you see something there? Yeah. He was an exception. He didn't speak like all the other prophets spoke. He didn't speak like everyone else did. Why? It's a mystery. But we're going to get to that today. Because in that, you're going to see the beauty of the Lord. You see, Job knew something. He knew something very deeply regarding the beauty of the Lord. He did. To Job, God was sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Job was longing to be in God's presence again. He realized that something had happened that caused a separation between him and God. And it wasn't necessarily his act. But he was reaping the results of whatever that act was. You understand? Which happens to some of us sometimes. I mean, was John the Baptist beheaded? Did he bring it upon himself? No. God permitted that, right? Right? Were the martyrs martyred? Were, the, were, you know, were people burned at stakes? Were, you know, things happen. God sometimes permits certain things for a deeper reason that we might not understand at that moment. You understand? You with me? Yes. Amen. Amen. So what, that's what we're seeing here. But Job, to Job, God was sweet. Sweet. You think God was sweet to David? He was sweet to David, no? He was sweet to Job. Sweet. Yeah, sweeter, let's say. <laughs> Right? Because even David writes some things that right, kind of almost put God in the place of being the one behind certain things. Right? But, so Job knew something. And in his stress and in his time of trial, he began to long to be back in God's presence. Why? If, if, if people had, you know, if, think about it. If a person thought 
that all these things were coming from God, the last place they would want to be is in the presence of God. You're with me? But Job wanted to be in the presence of God. He knew that there, it was because there was a, a breach somewhere that these things were happening. And he needed to make that link again with God. He needed to make that connection again with God. Notice here his, his words recorded in Job chapter 23, verse 3. Notice what Job says. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. That I might come ever to his seat. How many people, brethren, would be searching for God after such a tragic day? But here we see Job, he's trying to find God. He knows that God is not in it. Notice, he knows God is not in this. He needs to get back with God so that all of this can go away and things can change. Because in the presence of God is only what? Blessings and love and peace and joy and healing and strength. Amen? Amen. In the presence of God. Yeah. Pleasures untold. But not many people would be seeking for God if they had the wrong understanding of God. They would be running away from God. But Job had an understanding. Only those, brethren, that have tasted the sweetness of God would be seeking for Him in times where they recognize His absence. And they would be seeking for God for the same reason that Job was seeking for God. And where do we see the reason, the, 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 the motive behind why God, I mean, why Job was seeking after God? One, we know that he knew that God wasn't in what was happening and he needed to get back in the presence of God. But notice in verse 4 of Job chapter 23, he says, in other words, if I find God, he said, in, he said all that I, in verse, two, in verse 3, all that I knew where I might find Him, that I might come ever to His seat, I would order my cause before Him and fill my mouth with arguments. He knew that He could bring His complaints, His arguments, His feelings, His emotions, whatever. He can bring them to God. And God would not condemn him. That God would embrace him. God would say, come to here, my son. Let, tell me all about it. Let us reason together. Come. Let us reason together. Prove me now. Test me. I will be the one to bring it all back the way it should be. Praise the Lord. He knew. He says, I would fill my mouth with arguments in his presence. I would tell him everything. Brethren, Job wanted to present his problems before the only being in the entire universe that would be able to help him. Yeah. Your family might abandon you. Oh, yeah. Your friends, look what happened to Job. Did it happen to Job? Yes. If it happened to Job, would it be repeated again? Yes. His children abandoned the principles that he taught. You might have children. You might try to raise them up the right way. And they might go off and be sealed out of God. That doesn't necessarily mean it's your fault. Everyone has choice. Right? But you do your best. Train them up in the way they should go. And hopefully, right, they will choose to stay, stand fast in that, in those teachings. But is it, we see here, what happened? His children abandoned his principles. The thieves came. Everybody it was just, just taking advantage of all the things that he, his wife tells him: curse God and die. What kind of you know? What kind of wife? He says, "What are you? You know what? He didn't even call his wife foolish. You know that? He didn't tell her you're a foolish woman. He said you're speaking like the foolish women. Did you know that? I I, I love Job. Let me tell you something. I want to meet this man. I love Job. Job did not even. This man was so humble, you know. So loving. You think he knew God? Yes. He knew God. He tells his wife, you're speaking like the foolish women. Why are you doing that? Man. Everybody turned on him. 
all his friends, all his family. Until later on in the story. We know that. All his family and friends abandoned him in the time of need. And have you ever felt that way? You ever felt that way? Yeah. Have you ever gone through something and realized that none of your friends or family were there to help you? Even you, you, you how can they be my friends and family? And they don't even help. In times like those, brethren, there is one. There is one. One that is guaranteed to be there. And that is the one that we need to search for. Yes. Just like Job. Yes. Because he's sweet. He's beautiful. The same being that Job knew would not mock him is the one we need to run to. Amen. The one being that you can know would encourage and strengthen you instead of mock you and persecute you will, is guaranteed to be there. He would never not be there. You know, Job said in verse 5, I would know the words. Listen to this. Listen to what he's saying. You think he had a relationship? You know what I'm saying? You think he had a... He says, I would know the words which he would answer me. I know him. I know he won't mock me. I know he won't persecute me. I know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. How many of us can say that today? Man, I want that relationship. Yes. Amen? Yes. That you know what God is going to say. You, can, you know it. And you would understand, you know that you would comprehend what he's saying to you. Brethren, there was an assurance in Job's mind and his heart regarding the beauty of the Lord that was amazing. He knew that God was not a man and that God's only response to him would be one of love and compassion. Why? God does not change. One that would strengthen and not tear down. Because that's who God is. That's what love does. Love builds up. It doesn't tear down. Look at verse 6. Then he says, to, to kind of even like almost reprove his friends. Because what was his friends doing? Mocking him. Accusing him. Right? Right? He says, would God plead against me with his great power? In other words, would he do what you're doing to me? No. He says, no. But he would put strength in me. He wouldn't do what you're doing. God is not a man. He's God. He's love. You see, men's love is conditional. Uh, God's love is unconditional. Ah. He wouldn't do what you're doing to me. God, that's why I will always turn to God. Because God is the only one that will love me. Amen. No matter what. Yeah. He will be the one to protect me. No matter what. He will never dishonor me, disrespect me uh, like you guys are doing. He would never do that. So you know what? I have to cling to God. Amen? Amen? Call it a crutch. It's a crutch that everyone needs. Yeah. Without that crutch, you can't walk. Amen. Even though you think you're walking, you can't walk. Hallelujah, brethren. The beauty of holiness never seeks ill towards another, but rather refreshes with his showers of love. Amen. This is our God. Amen. Job recognized that in God's presence there was safety. Safety to even express his innermost thoughts and even discouragements. 
Job's even, Job even informs us that in his presence, verse 7, the righteous mighty dispute with him. Notice here, the righteous might, sorry, the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. This is what he says. He says, in his presence, the righteous may or might dispute with him. What does he say again? Come, let us reason together. In other words, I'm here. If you have an argument, bring it. Let's discuss it. I'll help you to understand. Clear. Don't be ashamed to come to me with questions. You know how many people say, you can't question God. Yes, we can. Yes, you can. You can question God. You can ask Him things. Yes. You want to know something? Ask God. What do you think prayer is? Prayer is asking God. It's questioning Him. It's saying, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? Or what is this? Or what's happening here? You get me? What, what is this about? Why is this happening? God is always there waiting for our questions because He has all the answers. Amen. If there's any being in the universe that has all the answers, wouldn't you want to question Him? I would have a million questions. When I go to heaven, holy man, I'm going to have a million questions to ask God. Yeah, I'll probably never, ever, ever uh, run out of questions. Yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, I'll probably never run out of questions. And you know what? He'll be there just answering patiently every question because that's who, what love does. Beautiful. So what does the Bible say? That the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Where do we find that? James 5.16. And you know that the opposite holds true to that too? For the prayers of the wicked are not heard. That's what we're told. Doesn't the Bible say that? Doesn't mean that God doesn't hear everything. It means that He can't legally honor something that is coming from uh, uh, the wrong motive, right? The evil heart. Right? If you're saying, "Well, God, I want a, a Mercedes Benz," you know, because uh, you know, you know, stuff like that. I'm just making that as an example, but that's what it means. It means if your if your prayers are are, are just motivated by ill or, or wickedness, God cannot honor that. You with me? You know, Job was considered a righteous man, wasn't he? He was living up to the light that he had received. Job was the type of person that would always... Did you know that if you read a little history of, of Job, if you go into the Spirit of Prophecy, and it gives you a little bit more information about Job, because Job, you know, the book of Job, you, you only see that story and that's it. The Job, you know. But if you're going to, you, you get a, a little bit of more information. Job was the type of person that would always seek to alleviate the sufferings of others. Yeah. He was a kind, gentle man. A humble man. He was a man of integrity. In other words, he wouldn't be moved to the left or to the right. Like we've been studying the angels in Ezekiel. They just move forward. In every direction they go, it's forward. Same thing with us. God wants us to move forward in every direction. Job was like that. Job was a man of integrity. He says, nope, I'm not going that way because that is, a, that is, violent, that's, 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 that's honoring God. I'm not going that way. He knows that his greatest need in time of trouble is to seek after God. He knew that. And he says in verse 8, Behold, I go forward. Does it go to the left or the right, right? But notice here, he says this, I go forward, but then he says, he's not there. He's realizing that his calamity is as a result because God is not in it. I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. In other words, in whatever direction I go, I don't... God is not there. He's missing. Something is wrong. Something has caused a breach. It is because He's not here that all these things have happened. You see, the history of Job reveals that troubles come upon us when God is not among us. Where do we find that? Deuteronomy 31, 17? Yeah? Yeah, around there? 
And we know that Isaiah 59 verses, I think, 1 and 2 also give us the principle of what causes this breach. History reveals these things. Troubles come when God is not there. And sometimes God steps back for a moment. He, because, it, let me tell you something. In the case of Job, he was God's man. He was, God's, he was so much God's man that even in the, in the little parabolic uh, meeting between Satan and God, God mentions him by name. Right? God knows this man. There's a relationship. But in the case of the righteous, whenever these evils come upon, it's because God is permitting them for a greater cause. Job might not have known that at that time, but yet he trusted God. That's what we need to do. Whenever things come upon us that we can't explain, we know that there's a separation there taking place, but if we know conscientiously that we're living according to the light that God has given to us, because there is a such thing as being conscious of obedience, there is, doesn't mean that you think yourself perfect, but you're conscious of your relationship with God, like Job was, he was conscious of the fact that he knew God. Amen? Paul said, I walk, I run the race, right? He was conscious of the fact that he, he, was, he was walking according to the light. You understand? So there's a, there's a possibility where we see here and many times that evils can come when God permits. On the side of the wicked, the opposite holds true. It's when God cannot prevent it. The wicked don't give God legal authority to protect them. Therefore, he can't prevent the evils to come upon them. Are you with me? So the history of Job reveals that troubles come upon us when God is not among us. And in Job's case, his children brought about this great separation. They were the, the culprits. They were at the age of accountability. And for the benefit of the grander cause of the gospel, God permitted it to go on for a time. Are you with me? God permitted what happened there to go on for a time. Notice that it was the first book written. That means there's something very important in this book for us. You understand? It is the first thing that God gave to Moses. God knew that this history, the history of Job, would be a lesson book to all succeeding generations going forward that sickness suffering and death come from Satan and not God this is why we see God permitting this to happen to Job in such a way it's similar to why we see the father hiding his face so to speak from Jesus at Calvary didn't that same thing happen to Jesus didn't many evils come upon Jesus himself Yes. He was tortured. Was Jesus tortured? In every way. Spiritually, I mean emotionally, everything, right? He was tortured, wasn't he? Yes. And then he was hung up on a, like a pin doll on the wall, on a piece of wood. I mean, that's torture. You know, he was, he was whipped and scourged. I mean, I mean, God, when there's a grander thing that needs to be shown, then God permits certain things. You understand? And if we're agents of God, we have to be like the special forces and, not, and just roll with it. You know what I mean? Whatever God permits, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. You understand? No matter what it is, all things. If you're scourged, praise the Lord. That's why Paul could say, I rejoice. I take joy in tribulation. Right? Take joy when you suffer for Christ's sake. Because that means God is actually using you for a greater cause. Not just isolated to your little particular geographic location or whatever. Or your situation. It's greater than you. That's, you understand what I'm saying? When we're persecuted and God permits it and we know we're consciously obedient to God. That means God is actually using you for a great work. Way bigger than you. Way bigger than your area it is going to be worldwide it's going to be something that's going to affect thousands of people you understand that's how it works man it's amazing god is amazing god is beautiful brethren Amen. are we willing to be used and expendable for the work of the gospel if it takes our blood 
if, if thousands of people would be saved in the kingdom by seeing evil manifested in your experience, wouldn't that be a blessing? When you get to heaven and see the she- bringing in, you see that you brought in the sheaves that God used you to bring in sheaves of people, bundles of individuals from all over the world. Think about this when Job sees all the people that were influenced by his his faithfulness to God in times of extreme tribulation. I don't think anybody could say that that's, that's uh, overreaching. That's, a, that's an accurate word. Extreme tribulation. Job went through extreme tribulation. So what happened, even what happened with Jesus, God had to allow these things for the greater good of the gospel and man's salvation. Amen? Praise the Lord. Job continues in verse 9. I'm making it easy for you today. All the scriptures are one after another. Isn't that nice? (laughs) It's nice to do that sometimes, right? Instead of jumping back and forth, all you hear is pages, and then you can't get to it fast enough, and I get to the next one, and you're like, wait a minute. You know, it's like all in order, you know? But anyway, it's a beautiful story. It shows the beauty of the Lord. Now, on the left hand, he says, on verse 9, on the left hand, where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. He's saying, oh, you see, although Job recognizes the separation that existed at that time, he had confidence that what had taken place was permitted for a reason. And you're going to see that in the next verse. verse we're going to jump over actually to verse 14 now. We're going to skip 10 through 13 and we're going to go to verse 14. You're going to see that Job recognized that his story was actually for the greater cause. He realized that if God was permitting this, it was for something appointed, something that was going to be bigger than his life. Look at verse 14. Talking about God, Job is saying, For he, God, performeth the thing that is appointed for me. In other words, this is my ministry. What's happening here is part of my ministry for his cause. It is appointed. Does God know the end from the beginning? Yes. So that whatever happens to you is appointed from God. You understand what I'm saying? It is because you are God's child. And God will use you as best as he can for the furtherance of the cause as we permit. And Job said, I'm yours. Whatever you want from me, Lord, here I am. I, I, will, I will go. He said, he performed the thing that is appointed for me and many such things are with him. Praise the Lord. Job was an instrument, brethren, in God's hand. And he knew that God had appointed him for such a time and event as that. God's beauty never faded for Job. At the end of Job's complaints, he did something that invited God's presence back. He prayed for his scoffing friends. He prayed. He knew, if I pray, God will come and attend. And this act brought about a change in his situation. Notice Job 42. We're going to jump to 42. So that's, that's a jump. And verse 10. Job 42, 10. We're going to see how the story ended for Job. You see, you allowed me to use you. And you know what now? I'm going to bring you the ease that you prayed for. The, the, the blessing, the, the restoration, the healing. Yeah. Notice here in verse 42. Uh, and this is why he didn't notice that. The first, what did he do? He prayed for his friends. Or we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll, we'll talk about that. But look at verse 10 of chapter 42. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. When? For who? For others. Notice after all that. He's praying for others. He's praying for those who are persecuting him. Wow. It didn't say he prayed for himself. Right? Although we can probably assume that there was some praying for his situation as well. But notice it says, no. His captivity was turned 
when he prayed for others, when he prayed for his persecutors, when he prayed for his scoffers. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, let me ask you, were Job's friends treating him as friends or enemies? Are you with me? You know, God always calls his enemies friends. He said, well, where did you get those wounds in your hands? Oh, I got these in the house of my friends. Right? To God, there's no enemies. So to Job, there was no enemies. His enemies were actually still his friends. See the mindset of Job? Did he have the mind of Christ? Yes. Was he a partaker of the divine nature? Yes. Think about it. When he prayed, he prayed for his friends. Like enemies, they scoffed at him. As opposed to trying to comfort him. Now, with friends like that, what did he say? We don't need enemies. <laughs> if our friends are like that, we don't, we don't need enemies. Jesus told us that if we prayed for those that persecute us, that we would be behaving like the Father. Isn't that what Jesus said? He yeah. say, what did he say? Love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, so that you can be what? Like the Father in heaven. You can be sons and daughters of the Father. Yeah. Right? It's if we allow His attributes to come into us. Amen? And notice the blessing he received because instead of praying for his own situation first, he said, no, I got to pray for them because they're worse off. Yes. Think about it. Were they worse off than Job or not? Yes. yes. So who needed the urgent prayer first? Yes. Ah, are you with me? Yes. This, is, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something, brethren. We need that. Okay. We need that mind. We need the mind of Christ. Ah, yes. A man who eschewed evil. Yeah. Job actually reflected the beauty of the Lord. Yeah. Job could say like David, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. Brethren, I had a bunch more to share, but I'm going to stop here. One thing I'm going to give you, a final closing scripture. And it's the same one we started with. The second one that we started with. Psalm 90 verse 17. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Let us pray. Amen. Dear loving Father, we want to thank you so much for revealing your beauty even in the mind and heart of Job. Truly, Lord, you, you have revealed yourself more to us today. And so, dear Father, we're grateful and we thank you. Let that mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, Lord. And that is in Christ Jesus. Let that mind be in us, Lord. Lord, continue to sanctify our hearts, purify us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remove every bit of selfishness from us, Lord, and bind our hearts to Christ as Job's heart was bound to Christ. And dear God, continue to bind our hearts to one another because even his enemies, Job saw them as his friends. Before thinking about himself, he said, I have to pray for them because their, their situation is so much worse. They don't realize where they are. They don't realize what they're doing. Lord, help us to have that same beauty. Your beauty, may it become our, ours. May it shine through us so that others can see you in us and be drawn to you. You said, if you be lifted up, you would draw all men unto you. So dear Father, use us as instruments to lift you up. And we pray, Lord, that you were lifted up tonight, today, in this study, in this midday message. And we pray, Lord, that you were, that it was acceptable in, in your sight. Because, Lord, we know that you're the inspiration to these things. And so, dear Father, continue to protect us, continue to bless us, continue to 
just bind our hearts even to one another and be with us for the remainder of this day and for the remainder of our lives. Be with our family members, be with our friends, be with our enemies, be with our children. Lord, have mercy. Continue to work in each of their hearts to draw them as you are drawing us to you. And Lord, we thank you and we ask these things according to your will. We know, Lord, that we can come and bring everything to you. And you have all the answers. And you answer our petitions even before we ask. Help us to believe your word. Help us to believe your promises so that we can benefit from them. So we can have rest in our souls on a moment-by-moment basis and not be like the heathens terrified and worried about every little thing that creeps up. Dear God, take charge over our lives. We give you the legal authority right now. And we ask this according to your will in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 And let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 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 I want to thank you, Elder Pablo, for that message. You know, it, it brought to mind, it brought to mind, um, no? Okay, it brought to mind a song, Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen on Me. But remember, remember no, that's seen in me. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Yes, so Job, huh? Yeah, we have a special song that's coming um, right now. Job had, well, as one person posted, he had frenemies. <laughs> Joe's friends are frenemies. Anybody have any frenemies? <laughs> All right. At this time, we're going to be blessed with a special song from young Keon. Come, Keon. All right. All right. Come, Ken, you're going to make Jesus very happy now. Not going to get cold feet. All right. Good. You have the music on.